terrible situation that happened. But so why not compare it with Vietnam or World War II? You know. Actually, I, for the book that I'm working on now, I start with um, Japan and Germany and talking about the role of non-governmental organizations and those kind of nation-building exercises. I totally agree with you. These are, and, and also because they were led by the international community or led by the United States. That's why, for this most recent book, we did state building in the Balkans, Afghanistan, and Iraq, because these were state building exercises that were recent, that we're spending lots of money on, because people really genuinely wanted to know, as different as these experiences have been, has the United States, have other international actors learned and changed their behavior as a result of these? But, but I totally agree, what we're talking about is a different phenomenon that is called state building. It's talking about developing local capacities and institutions of governance as well as economic development. Um, so I, I think it is, and because this, the examples, the cases are so wildly different in terms of cultures and experience and because of what they wanted or did not want from the international community, to put them together is, is sometimes like comparing apples and oranges. Um, Sorry, Gaz. Yes, okay. I think I know your yes, uh, regarding the state building and the learning, uh, state learning, uh, you can compare UN and you can, can compare uh, with the US, but I think US historically has been much more successful than UN when it comes to state building. Uh, UN is much more oriented, is procedure oriented, and that's why it keeps into memory, it, it retains information in the memory. In the memory, whereas USA for me is much more result oriented. Yes, US has uh, has bombed Japan, and yes, Japan is very progressive now, and it's, it's a very democratic state. America has US has intervened in Germany, and it's 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 a uh, it's a uh, the leading economic power in Europe. Um, so it's done a great job in South Korea. It's done a great job, but uh, I think one of the reasons why. Uh, there was a mess in Iraq and in other countries is that the, the sense of emergency uh, pushed the, the U.S. to make decisions quick. Uh, U.S. has not done the same thing in Kuwait, let's say, or uh, in Saudi Arabia. It has managed the relationship very well, but the, the problem was that you had, uh, U.S. has to, had to manage a situation that was already out of control. You had, dictators over there, you had no people on the ground, and it, everything was totally new, so it was going, it was really like going into a war zone, because it was a war zone. Um, the sense of emergency, I think, reshaped pretty much uh, the, the way U.S. intervened, uh, let's say, uh, in differently in Japan, or in South Korea, or in Vietnam, and, and in, in the Middle East right now, and of course, the intervention was much more different in the Balkans. In, and actually, there are so many differences between Bosnia and Kosovo. And totally two different stories, even though so, we are so close geographically. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I need to disagree or agree, but I, I think that there is somewhat of a sampling bias in terms of looking at Japan and Germany and saying, well, these are the success stories in the United States and they're more successful. I, I think that. Really, James Dobbins' work on the United Nations, and again, coming from someone who's been very involved with, you know, in many administrations in state building and nation building, a lot of the cases that the United Nations has taken on has taken on kind of harder cases and also with less resources, certainly less military resources. So it's really hard with state building to hold the task constant in terms of the difficulty. It's also really hard when you're comparing the United States that has, that spends more on its military than all the other countries in the world combined to say, well, the United States is more successful. We got more you know, toys in terms of military, so it kind of makes it easier for us in some respects. But again, that's, that's not even holding the difficulty of the task constant, which you know, these are very different tasks in terms of all the problems internally. So you know, I, I still think that, uh, well, I'm not sure in terms of the United Nations, it seems that there's maybe better ways for the United Nations to institutionalize learning and with administrations that come and go, they can change or they can reject the previous administrations and, and their ideas and what they felt like they learned um, from foreign policy experiences. Can I just say, uh, so far I don't know of any case where the United Nations has built a country uh, proper, let's say, the conflict and the, and, and the aftermath and 
gotten uh, the country up and running. Let's say maybe it's not a good case to take Germany or Japan but, and, or South Korea, but they are doing great. So what has uh, UN done? Which is the country that uh, is functioning and is, is a good example, not a good, uh, that can stand on its own? I don't know of any case. Maybe Who's I'm wrong. Who's thinking El Salvador? Who's thinking El Salvador? Those sort of people tout as the UN success stories. I think the Germans and the Japanese would have a lot to disagree with in terms of the United States, is the importance of the United States in those countries and nation building. You know, that there are a lot of yeah. Of course. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I was just thinking about the comparison that was being mentioned between the Balkans and um, Afghanistan and, and Iran. For me, from what you were saying, uh, and, and I guess it's coming from you know working on the perspective from the perspective of journalism and media, is that it was projected to the people that these were mm -hmm. set the same. And I think that's why maybe you mentioned it, it was this. I mean, even. Um, uh, when uh, what I remember Blair saying, you know, we're going to Iraq, we did really well in Kosovo, this is what we have to do. Yeah. We have to do this in Iraq as well. And it was just like everyone was up, all, you know, one million people protested in London, and that was being told to them, look, we're going to do, you know, although it was a completely different situation entirely. And um, even just seeing the um, news on Monday of Obama, uh, Osama bin Laden's death, and then Blair coming on and saying, you know, we did this really great thing with. Um, killing this man, like we did with the intervention in Kosovo. And I was just like, how is that the same thing? So I think that's probably the way that it's projected, and um, uh, that I, I took away from that. And that's where I think I see that you know, sort of, they've been projected as the same thing, and then maybe you don't necessarily see that it's different when you're applying uh, foreign policy. Yeah, and, and actually, I can recall, I don't remember the date, obviously, where the New York Times had you know, the lessons of the Balkans for Afghanistan. And so these, and, and I agree exactly with this gentleman's point that initially the Bush administration, as, as a candidate, uh, President Bush was very opposed to nation building. He wanted to withdraw from the Balkans completely. Things changed, and so there were two different. So, you know, there was this comparison that was made with the Balkans and what was going to happen or should happen in Afghanistan and Iraq. But also within the Bush administration, you can see almost two separate orientations, foreign policy orientations, before 9/11 and after 9/11 things really changed. So he went from a president that was very opposed to nation building and felt like the United States was not going to do that. Condoleezza Rice came out very strongly and said, this is not what we have a big military for, was to walk kids to school in Kosovo or something. But after 9-11, the orientation of the world had changed a great deal. Because as you said earlier, they considered that to be a success. They, they projected it that it was easy and successful. And so therefore, if we intervene in Afghanistan, Iraq, it's going to be the same. But prior to that, it was not something that the Bush administration wanted to do, thought that we should do, or even thought that it was a success story. It was, this is, we're done with nation building. But the motivation for intervention in both regions is different. Mm -hmm. Interventions in the in both in Kosovo is humanitarian intervention, we said that. Mm -hmm. Now the intervention in Afghanistan and Iraq is for U.S. interests. We all agree on that. Totally agree. Although it was the sold as the same. Yeah. Well, I mean, we are all in PR, so we have to sell it somehow. Uh, the biggest challenge to 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 the interventions and, and after was in, the nation building in Iraq and Afghanistan was the lack of support of the population, whereas you didn't have it here. I mean, everybody in Kosovo, even today. If you say that you're American, you know you can get free macchiatos all over the place. It's pretty much similar in Boston to some degree. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Afghanistan and in Iraq, you've never had the support of the population. Now, if you are being shot at, I don't think that a soldier or, a, or, a, or a, as a person going to, to rebuild Afghanistan will be thinking a lot about reconstruct. You will be thinking how you're going to survive. So this is the reason why I, I don't agree that you can compare, and I don't think we can take any lessons from the region here and apply it in a region that is very hostile to your intervention to begin with. That's, that's my, my argument. Maybe you can compare uh, Vietnam and, and, and Iraq m m would be a better comparison than, than comparing, let's say, uh, Balkan states with, with uh, Afghanistan. Let's not forget, though, before, I mean, in the early stages of Iraq, they were looking at the Bosnian constitution as a possible model for the constitution of Iraq. They were. I guess that's right, because the same people were working on the constitution. It may not be changed, so. Well, one last question, because it's one o'clock and people have got to go. Oh, I'm sorry, you this is here. I just had a short, I was just wondering, in the Middle East now, which way are we going to follow? 
You know, which way is the world going to follow in all these different little countries that are, we need help, we need help, we need, we need help on um, them? We will know. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a comment. Go ahead. Uh, my question was, uh, uh, can you share us a little bit about your views what, and what you're now working on the civil society in the state building and, and how you see it? Um, my question derives from the, my, for example, the Kosovo experience, but I have also the Middle Eastern experience. Uh, when you say that um, uh, Balkans spoiled Americans because they thought that uh, everybody thinks the same. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you look at now the, uh, the for example, Kosovo case, um, I'm not so sure that uh, Americans or West us understood what is the civil society in Kosovo. We established 40,000 plus uh, NGOs, and we call them uh, the uh, civil society, which in fact 90% of them are consulting companies. So, um, uh, so and then having no, no support for the server, uh, some better than those is now of course important to fight but it's an NGO. But uh, of course it's an exception in this thing and then I think of the, the women NGO. The same goes in, in Middle East that the, the, uh, the, the traditional way of civil society acting is not the way we act in, in the West. And how do you look at this, this dilemma? That is exactly um, a major issue, uh, an essential argument I make in my book and if it's Bosnia, Kosovo, Cambodia, East Timor, Afghanistan, it's the same kind of phenomenon that we have held up this idea of civil society and promoting civil society, but in essence, in essence what has happened is we've created this whole kind of NGOization of these post-conflict countries. And in most post-conflict countries, and even if it's not led by the United States or led by Western actors, you see the same phenomenon of non-governmental organizations existing, sometimes to put money in people's pockets, but not really doing anything for civil society. So I talk about this disjuncture, how the 1990s, um, where I, in, in Central and Eastern Europe, there was this kind of birth, rebirth of civil society. And in fact, what happened as a result of that was kind of a, a manipulation of this idea of civil society and people kind of using civil societies as a synonym uh, or NGOs as a synonym for civil society when in fact they were very different. So I talk about that kind of mythologizing of civil society and the unintended consequences of that in those kind of countries. I think at this